This is a short video explaining the difference between the post date and pay period of a wage. A wage contains two different dates that are used by withholding agencies to establish reporting and payment liability. The post date of a wage should always be the payday established by your governing board. It's the day paychecks are distributed to employees by paycheck or direct deposit. It's payday. The pay period of a wage represents a range of dates in which the employee earned the wage. For state retirement purposes, the pay period is an exact established range of dates. For example, monthly, semi-monthly, bi-weekly, or weekly. To understand how OPERS and OPNF expect you to use and report pay periods, please consult the OPERS or OPNFPF employer manuals. Because withholding agencies do not use the same dates to establish reporting and payment liability, in UAN, the payroll software withholdings are divided into two groups, regular and state retirement. Let's take a look at regular first. Regular withholdings use the post date or payment date of a wage to establish liability. Remember the post date is payday. It's established by your board the day the wage is given to the employees. Regular withholdings are absolutely everything except state retirement. So that includes all taxes, insurance, deferred compensation, child support, garnishment, anything but state retirement. State retirement is only OPERS or OP and FPF. OPERS is Ohio Public Employees Retirement System and OP and FPF is the Ohio Police and Fire Pension Fund. These are state retirement agencies. They both use the pay period end date of a wage to establish the monthly reporting and payment liability. When a single pay period begins in one month and ends in the next month, which is common with a biweekly frequency, it's always reported in the month with the pay period end date. I'll start by showing some sample pay schedules for the most common pay frequencies, monthly and biweekly. Our pay schedules used in this video may not represent how you pay wages for the same frequency. Keep in mind this is a sample to teach the difference between the post date and the pay period of a wage. Apply what you learn to your pay schedules. Let me explain this sample monthly pay schedule. Our elected officials, the trustees and fiscal officer, are paid at the monthly meeting for last month's pay period. When establishing a pay schedule, I should not see a gap between the end date of one pay period and the begin date of the next pay period. You can see my first wage has a pay period end date of December 31, 2017, and the next wage starts the next day with the pay period begin date of January 1st. There's no gap because the pay period starts the next day. Now let's talk specifics. I can tell from this grid that my first wage paid in January is for the pay period ending in December of the prior year. This means the tax liability month is different than the state retirement liability month. This paycheck dated January 11th has a January tax liability. These are January taxes. However, the pay period ends in December. The state retirement liability is associated with the December pay period end date, so it will be reported on my December OPERS report. This continues throughout the year with my schedule. The paycheck date establishes the tax liability in the current month, and the pay period end date establishes the state retirement liability in the month before the paycheck. The W-2 for 2018 will include only the paychecks dated in the same year. The last wage on this list will be paid in the new year. It will not be included on the 2018 W-2, but will be reported on the December OPERS report because of the pay period end date. The January paycheck will use the new year appropriations as required. Wages do not carry over encumbrances when earned in a prior year and are paid in the new year. Wages are not the same as purchase orders, so don't apply the same rules. 
So in this sample, the post date and the pay period end date clearly separates taxes and retirement liability into different months. This sample monthly schedule is used by many of our clients and is not a problem with tax agencies, state retirement, or audit. I'll show you another sample. This is a different monthly pay schedule used by some of our clients. There is only one difference between the early sample and this sample. In January, our elected officials receive no paycheck even though they have a January meeting. In a small entity with no other paid employees, that means there's no taxes in January because there are no paychecks. Tax agencies do not need you to report wages earned in a month, only wages paid. And in this example, there were no wages paid in January. In February, the elected officials are paid for the January pay period, and that pattern continues through the rest of the year until December. At the December regular meeting, as usual, the elected officials are paid for the past month's pay period and on December 31st, the board holds a special year-end meeting where they wrap up the year's business and are paid for the December pay period. That means the tax liability for the month of December includes both paychecks that are dated in December. It also means the first December paycheck is reported on the November OPRS report and the second December paycheck is reported on the December OPRS report because the state retirement report determines liability by the pay period end date. This sample monthly schedule is also not a problem with tax agencies, state retirement, or audit. The major difference in this sample is all of these annual wages are paid within the same calendar year, so they're included on the same W-2 because payday for all the paychecks fall within the same calendar year. While this is tidy, it's not required. There are many entities that do not hold a special year-end meeting and have no desire to start. I just wanted to illustrate how this schedule, used by some of our clients, causes zero January tax liability and causes two paychecks to be included in the December tax liability. Tax agencies do not care when or how often people are paid. They require you to report and pay taxes associated with the paycheck date. Now let's talk about the more complex bi-weekly pay schedule. Bi-weekly pay schedules, according to the state retirement agencies, OPERS and OPNF, must begin on the same day of the week established by your governing board. Well, what does that mean? It means your board determines if the pay period begins on Saturday, Sunday, Monday. But whatever date they establish, that is always the pay period begin day. A bi-weekly pay period contains exactly 14 days, never more and never less. While an employee may not work all 14 days, the pay period contains 14 days in its structure. In Sample Buckeye Township, our bi-weekly pay period begins on a Saturday. It's 14 days long and ends on a Friday. So pay period begin date is always a Saturday and pay period end dates are always a Friday. At the end of the pay period on Friday, my employees are required to turn in their time cards. The next pay period begins on Saturday and continues for 14 days. That's our bi-weekly pay period structure adopted by our board. We'll talk about pay day in a minute. Now your entity may start your bi-weekly pay period on a different day of the week. Here's a sample of a bi-weekly schedule when the pay period begin day is Sunday. I think you get the idea. Each bi-weekly pay period starts on the same day of the week and contains exactly 14 days. Let me show you my annual bi-weekly pay schedule. Just like my monthly samples, the bi-weekly schedule has a pay period begin date, a pay period end date, and the board established pay day. The pay period end date establishes my state retirement monthly liability and the pay day, which in UAN is the post date on the check, establishes my regular withholding liability. That includes all taxes, child support, garnishments, etc. Anything that's not state retirement. 
Just like other frequency pay schedules, the biweekly frequency annual schedule should never have a gap between the pay period end date of one pay period and the pay period begin date of the next pay period. The pay period begin date is always the next day after the last pay period end date. And each pay period is exactly 14 days long, never shorter, never longer. All my employees may not work every single day of the pay period or every single pay period of the year, but the annual schedule shows all my pay periods and the payday for that pay period. In Sample Buckeye Township, our employees are paid on a bi-weekly basis for their last bi-weekly time card. This structure is used by the Auditor of State to pay its bi-weekly employees and is probably used by our larger UAN clients and is very common in the non-government workforce. It allows the fiscal officer sufficient time to process payroll before payday. We also see some entities using a bi-weekly pay schedule where the employees turn in their time cards on Friday and they're paid the following Friday. There's just one week between turning in the time card and being paid. This structure still allows the fiscal officer time to review and process the time cards, but doesn't require the employees to wait two full weeks before they're paid. Your governing board should have established what day of the week the employees are required to submit their time cards and what date they will be paid. Follow your entity's board established payday. Remember payday, the post date in UAN, is the day you distribute employee checks or they receive their direct deposit. Let's evaluate the tax and retirement liability of our bi-weekly sample on the screen. Since the tax liability for this employee's wages is based on the payment date, the first two wages posted in January are January taxes. The two paychecks dated in February are February taxes. And the two paychecks dated in March are March taxes. That tax liability is very simple. It's associated with the paycheck date. Now let's look at the state retirement liability. The state retirement liability is not related to the paycheck date at all. The pay period end date is used to determine where the wages belong on a monthly retirement report. The pay period begin date is not relevant except that the pay period should be 14 days long. In this example, the first wage has a pay period end date of December 29, 2017. This wage was reported on the December 2017 State Retirement Report with other 2017 paychecks that had a December ending pay period. Since the paycheck date is January, it will not be included on the prior year W-2. Taxes associated with the January 12th check are January taxes. Only state retirement uses the pay period to establish the monthly liability. The second and third wages have pay period end dates in January 2018. Therefore, they are reported on the January state retirement report. Let's go down to the fourth wage. Notice it has a pay period begin date of January 27, 2018, but the end date is in February on the 9th. This is not a problem. It frequently occurs with the biweekly pay schedule. The pay period end date of the wage governs the reporting month. Therefore, this entire paycheck is reported in February with the fifth check in the list because both paychecks have a pay period end date in February. With a true biweekly frequency, there are at least two months a year that the employees will receive three paychecks and there are also at least two months of the year that have three paychecks with the same pay period end month requiring all three to be included on a monthly state retirement report. Let me scroll down this list to show you where this happens. Remember, my biweekly employees get paid every other Friday for the previous biweekly pay period. So on my schedule, this places three paychecks in the OPRS reporting months of June and November. We can see June on the screen right now. Notice that the tax liability is different in those months. While both June and November 
also have three paychecks in the tax liability, they're not the same three paychecks as the OPRS monthly report. These three paychecks have a June ending pay period and will all be reported on the June OPRS report. But these three paychecks have a June paycheck date. They will be reported as June taxes. I'll scroll down and show you November. Here are my three paychecks with a November date. These will be November taxes. Here are my three paychecks with a November ending pay period. They will be reported on the November OPRS report because of the pay period end date. The final point I want to make on our biweekly sample is the last paycheck on the list. You can see in our biweekly schedule that the pay period that begins on December 15th and ends on December 28th in 2018 will be paid in the new year on January 11th, 2019. That paycheck will be reported to State Retirement on the December 2018 report because the pay period end date establishes the monthly liability for State Retirement. Furthermore, the wages and taxes associated with the January 11, 2019 check will be January 2019 wages and taxes. It will post against the New Year appropriations as required and will be included with the paid wages in 2019 on the 2019 W-2. It is not placed on the 2018 W-2 with all the wages above in this schedule. The date of the check determines the tax liability. This check is dated in the new year. It is highly recommended that you create schedules like our samples for each of your pay frequencies before the beginning of each year so you have a clear schedule for payday and the associated pay periods. Knowing ahead of time if a payday falls on a holiday helps you be prepared to have the board approve an alternate date before the year begins. Employees love having a clear understanding of what day they will be paid and you will have a clear schedule as to what wages will be included on the OPERS or OPNF reports and your tax payments. I have very good news. The UAN software automatically separates regular withholdings associated with the paycheck date from state retirement withholdings that are associated with the pay period end date when creating tax and retirement reports and payments. Let me show you an example. When I go to Payroll, Transactions, Withholding Payments, when I click the Add button, I have to choose between Regular and State Retirement. The reason they're separated is because State Retirement uses the pay period end date and Regular uses the paycheck post date. So while the software does a lot of the hard work for you, you must learn to review wage and withholding reports with the proper setting. Let me show you. If we go to Payroll Reports and Withholding Reports, the Withholding Summary defaults to the original post date. That means I should never look at OPERS or OPNF, my State Retirement Withholdings, with this setting. I should always select everything but OPERS and OPNF for the original post date because all of my regular withholdings are based on my original post date. When I want to look at my state retirement withholdings, I change the setting to pay period end date, and then I only select OPERS and OPNF. That will show me the reports with the accurate information showing the monthly liability. If I use the wrong setting, I'll have the wrong amounts in the wrong months. So be careful to use the proper setting when looking at regular withholdings and state retirement withholdings. I hope the information in this video was helpful. If you need assistance with the steps shown in this video, contact UAN Support using the information provided on the screen. All UAN Housekeeping Series videos qualify for House Bill 10 training. 
If you have any questions about self-reporting your training hours, please call or email your question using the contact information you see on the screen now. This video is not long enough to self-report by itself. If you have only watched this video, you cannot self-report the time. However, if you watch more videos in the housekeeping series and their combined time is at least 30 minutes, you can self-report the combined time.